Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Alright guys, I just finished watching this. Sort of the evolution of the Spitfire, and now the next recommended was uh, in the cockpit. Awesome. Let's go. My name's Connor, the original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord. Click on it, send it right over there, love to have you, let's go. And it's a very special aircraft. Today, we're stood here with the Imperial War Museum Spitfire Mark I, N3200. It's the only airworthy aircraft in the museum's collection and is a very special aircraft to us. The prototype Spitfire first flew in March 1936 and the first operational examples arrived here at RAF Duxford in August 1938. Those examples were Mark I, exactly uh, as the aircraft we've got here, which was an example of the RAF's monoplane eight-gun single-seat, single-engine fighter. And today we'll be taking a look inside the cockpit of our combat veteran Mark I. Yes. The history of this aeroplane is a very important one, but it also links quite nicely to the history of the Spitfire in general. The Spitfire first came into operational service here at RAF Duxford on the 4th of August 1938, when number 19 Squadron accepted the first operational examples. Our Spitfire was not one of those original examples, but does Oops. go on to serve with 19 Squadron when it arrives here in April 1940. It carries the codes QV, which were the wartime codes of number 19 squadron. This particular Spitfire was the 414th production Spitfire. A huge number of Spitfires are produced after this one, but this is a very early original Mark I, before the addition of increased engines or armament that the war would progress. Let us look at the inside of a pilot's cockpit with its massive instruments and then think of the hours of practice needed before the pilot can understand all their uses and employ them satisfactorily. See the pilot in his kit. It is bad enough to be two in maps. a flying overall. But look at this. Sorry, you see that? The two map holders in his legs? See the pilot in his kit. Sorry. It is bad enough to be in a flying overall. But look at this. The life belt used when flying over the sea. It is called a May West, rather unkindly. Now the parachute. It is impossible to look pompous in a parachute. Oh, you sit on the parachute? So we're now sitting inside the cockpit of the Imperial War Museum Spitfire Mark I N3200. Seems it a is a fully airworthy aircraft Smug. and it is finished exactly as it would have appeared in the... Okay, um... Uh... Climb, descent. Is that for like if you go into a climb? It's a, um, uh, what am I looking at? Oh, fuel gauge. Yeah, I'll react to that. Oh, sure. You will. Thanks, man. Fuel gauge. Uh, your level, landing, lamps. Uh, oil. I thought I was going to be able to kind of guess what I'm looking at, and I, I might as well be looking at air rocket equations. Where the aircraft, and it is finished exactly as it would have appeared in the early summer of 1940, when it was unfortunately lost in the area near Dunkirk on the 26th of May 1940. To make an airworthy aircraft these days, especially one of the vintage of this Spitfire, lots of things have to be taken into consideration to make sure that it is safe. But they do, where possible, try to stick to originality. Um, the dials that we're looking at in here, although not necessarily from this Spitfire or indeed a Spitfire at all, they are of the correct type. Um, during the Second World War, the majority of these dials would have looked very familiar to uh, any British pilot flying any British aircraft. So the originality in here is key, but also uh, the consideration is safety. These aircraft do fly. They have to be safe for the pilots who fly them and those on the ground watching them. The Spitfire was a leap forwards in technology within the RAF. It was replacing biplane aircraft with fixed undercarriage. So a lot of things uh, had to be taken into consideration by the pilots learning to fly these new fast fighters. A typical Spitfire startup would see a lot of action going on inside the cockpit. In the traditional idea of a Battle of Britain scramble, of course, the ground crew would have... What did that say on it? 
Don't come and tell, ring this like hell. In the traditional idea of a Battle of Britain scramble, of course, the ground crew would have started it up before the pilot climbed in. But if you were to start the aircraft, you'd be looking at setting the throttle over on the left-hand side, the magnetos and the starting magneto, as well as priming the engine with the Kai gas primer. You'd make sure that the fuel was turned on and then you would fi flick down the button there and you would fire the engine. Once the engine is running, the temperatures and pressures start to come up on the dials over on the right hand side and things start to get quite hot in the engine very quickly. In the early Second World War period, when Spitfires were operating from Duxford, they would have had a nice big grass airfield to use. They'd have pointed into wind and they'd have aimed to get into the air as quickly as they possibly could before the engine overheated. I, I hear on, uh, on other videos on aircraft carriers, the aircraft carriers often, uh, when they're getting ready to send the planes off, they'll purposely steer, uh, steer so they're going into the wind just to... Uh, make it eas more easier for them to take off with a with a small runway. Once they were in the air, which I would imagine, if they were waiting for ones to land on the aircraft carrier, would they want to do the opposite? The pilots they possibly Sorry. could before the engine overheated. Once they were in the air, the pilot's hand would be on the left hand side on the throttle and on the, the normally their right hand would be on the control column here. Now the take off. Throttle right forward. Stick central. Knees are off the ground. Back with the throttle to normal boost. And now up with the wheels. Okay, but okay, but one thing. Back right forward. On the control so column they, here. So you have your right hand on, on, on your on your your this on the steering right and the left hand on the throttle, kind of like on a boat, right? And you put the throttle forward as you're going steady, but do, do you want to like pull the, the steering back to like angle the, the plane or does the, does the plane just go into the air automatically when, when you reach a certain speed? Now the take off, throttle right forward, stick central. Ease her off the ground, back with the throttle to normal boost. And now up with the wheels. Once they've taken off and they're into a relatively safe climbing attitude, they would have to reduce the speed uh, by reducing the throttle. And they also would then have to think about bringing up the undercarriage. No easy task in this particular mark of Spitfire. The pilot would have to move his left hand from the throttle across to the control column. And then his right hand would have to go down to the right hand side of the seat. They would select undercarriage up. Now on our particular Spitfire, it is still equipped with something that all of the very early Mark I Spitfires were equipped with. And that is a hand pumped undercarriage. There is no easy switch on here that will bring the undercarriage up. He has to pump this big black handle. Wow. Now it was often said that very early Spitfire pilots having to undertake this would have been seen to porpoise as they took off because their left hand on the stick and their right hand on the pump would have caused the aircraft to bounce as it got airborne. What did you think to the Spitfire as a machine to fly? Well, it was marvellous. Um, uh, the Spitfire 1, I suppose, the Mark 1. Well, coming off the Miles Master, on which we were trained, um, it was absolutely marvellous. And it took a lot more punishment than a Miles Master. And it was very, very sensitive um, to fly. You had no trouble about um, exerting a lot of pressure. If you got into difficulties, I mean, if the thing stalled, and span, um, if you took your hands and feet off everything, it would just come out on its own accord. It was a very stable aircraft, and really it had no vices at all. So the pilots flying the Spitfire were gaining something that their predecessors didn't have. They had a nice closing cockpit, which kept out some of the conditions, the wind and some of the temperature. There was a small element of heating in the cockpit, but it would have been pretty cold up there. Hence the need for a large over jacket, such as the uh, fur-lined Irvin.
Looks the pilot would have also too. worn a leather flying helmet. As a helmet, it's not going to give you much protection, but it carries some important items. It carries the earphones so that you can hear uh, radio telegraph communications, and there is the plug which connects you to the aircraft. On the front of the uh, flying helmet as well, you would connect your oxygen mask, which would have your microphone. Once you've got all of your kit on inside the aeroplane, you'd be relatively snug, but even still inside this aircraft, it would be incredibly noisy, both from the engine in front, potentially the guns firing on the outside, and just the air conditions around you. Guys, uh, I I if your engine shut off, right, and you were at, I, I don't know, uh, 10,000 feet or something like that, or whatever normal height they were, they would go in on bombing runs or whatever, and it, and it cut off, I wonder how far you could glide I'm assuming if you're going into the wind, you could glide further, maybe? Because if you're going like, with the wind, you might think it push you further, but you won't get as much lift. Um, yeah, so. The idea okay. from your earlier training was to sort of make a three-port landing. You didn't always succeed, but a little like the... Uh, I feel so disrespectful not listening to the veteran. From your earlier training. Around you. The idea from your earlier training was to sort of make a three port landing. You didn't always succeed, but a little like the older biplanes, if you just landed on your wheels, that's the front wheel, and you hadn't lost sufficient airspeed, you could bounce in the air again. So the idea was to um, try and do it almost at a three-point landing. Then you would taxi round and do another takeoff and landing using all these new... By three-point landing, he means, does he, he means like making as well as you can, as, as, as best as you can to make the single back wheel and two front wheels touch at the same time. I tech gadgets such as undercarriage. I hate interrupting ah, this guy. I'm so sorry. You would taxi round and do another takeoff and landing using all these new high tech gadgets such as undercarriage and flaps, etc. But you soon got used to it. So the pilot sitting inside the Spitfire after having taken off, brought the undercarriage up, goes through a number of checks. They're going to look at the dials in front of them to make sure that everything is looking good fuel pressure, oil pressure, temperatures, you don't want your aircraft to be overheating before you go into combat. Once the pilot is then satisfied with that, they're going to do a number of things. They're going to trim the aircraft so it can fly relatively straight and level hands off. And then most pilots would unlock the hood, slide it back to make sure that in the event of an emergency there were no obstructions. They would also lower their seat slightly. That gave them a sense of uh, comfort, but it gave them a bit of protection from the armour plate behind them and to an extent the engine in front as well. They would then turn on the reflector gun sight, the switch is just up here, and the reflector gun sight is what they're going to be using to aim at the enemy aircraft. And likely the last thing they're going to do yeah, what is, is to this? turn the gun button from safe to fire. While the leader so searches the sky in front for the enemy, it is bitterly cold, and the curious depression and feeling of isolation that comes when flying at great height would insensibly affect the pilot's fighting qualities if he were not helped by his oxygen supply. Suddenly the leader, who has been keeping up a two-way conversation with the ground control which is directing him onto the enemy, sights something. Tally ho! There they are, Jerry's. Aspitfire is equipped with a rear view mirror. Rear view mirrors were not standard on early Mark Spitfires that came in much later on. And in fact, this particular Spitfire's mirror would have come from a civilian car, possibly somewhere on the base at Duxford. The fairing around it gives it an element of streamlining. And today in flight, that fairing causes our Spitfire to whistle. The Spitfire was nothing like I'd flown like it before and oddly enough I've never flown anything like it since it was a, a wonderful aeroplane to fly I mean and you were part of the aircraft some aircraft you sit in them and you fly them well after a, not a lot of experience of a Spitfire 
you became part of the aircraft and you felt you could do anything in it. So we have just seen inside the cockpit. Guys, how many British pilots time travel back to World War II in their planes would you need to go against modern RAF pilots in modern planes and they would have a chance? Like, I wonder, like, how many modern RAF pilots in their jets could take on how many uh, Spitfire World War II in their prime uh, pilots. Just wondering. Of our Spitfire Mark I. The Spitfire goes on to be evolved into numerous marks throughout its production life, in a uh, culminating fight. in over 22,500 Spitfires and Seafires of all variants being built. But it's very important and we are very lucky to have in our collection such an early version of the Spitfire. One most associated with victory during the Battle of Britain and really to have one in the early Mark I guys and from there we can see the lineage of the Spitfire develop. So we've seen inside the cockpit today. If you would also like to experience the same opportunity of sitting inside the pilot seat of our airworthy combat veteran Mark I, take a look on our website and come down to Duxford for your own experience. Great video, great channel. My sub, subscribe, definitely worth subscribe. Both videos, really good. If you guys answer any of the questions I had, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I'm always amazed by the, the knowledge that uh, a lot of people have um, the viewers uh, I have on, on certain videos I'm watching, I have questions, and someone always seems to, to help me out, at least one, often many of you. You guys are just so nice and awesome. Um, hope you guys are all doing well. If not, chin up. You'll be good soon. See you guys next time. Bye.